Father, I thank you for this word that I'm going to share today. I thank you that we'll have ears to hear um, and eyes to see what the Spirit is saying to the church today. In Jesus' name, speak to our heart, change our lives. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. All right, well, we're, today we want to talk. Last week I started a series on generosity. We started with uh, generous worship. How many were here for that? We talked about generous worship. We had a video series uh, by Greg Rochelle. Uh, in, in the small small groups and uh, had to do with lifting of hands. How many enjoyed that? A simple message, but just a truth that we need to be reminded of. And I'm going to have Allison come up quickly for a moment because I can see you're going for my peripheral vision. So, I just wanted to make a mention about the Connect group. We watched the video, and um, it, part of it was, a, who uh, was everybody, who was all in a Connect group that did that? And it was about raising hands and surrender and victory, right? Anyways, well, through faith, we all did that, and I'm telling you guys, the Spirit of God was in my house. It was awesome, and it wasn't that we wanted to praise like he had to be praised. It was just fantastic. So if you're not in a connect group, get in one, and uh, this teaching is really powerful, so listen good. Yeah. Awesome. So yes, yeah, so we talked about generous, uh, generous uh, worship last week. Today, we're actually starting a three-week series on generosity uh, financially and I want to say this if you're part of this church or you're new to this church um, we don't we don't talk about money a lot from the pulpit this is not something we do much but once a year I like to do a series on finances um, so that we understand biblically how many know we got to preach the full counsel of God right so I want to talk about the things that are important to the Lord and so as we move on here um, I, I, I like this uh, quote by um, John Bunyan and he wrote this many years ago and it says here, you have not lived today until you have done something for someone who can never repay you. Uh, and, and there's something about being able to bless someone without having a, a need to have a return. How many know what I'm talking about? Uh, this is the heart of God. There's no way we can repay God for what he did in sacrificing his son. I mean, that's something we can never repay. And God, that's the character of God. Amen? God's a, God's a giver. God's a cheerful giver. And... Uh, I want to look at a verse here uh, in Proverbs 11.25. Proverbs 11.25. The generous will prosper, all right? Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. Uh, the generous will prosper. This is a promise in the word of God that we can hold to. And if you're a generous person, you will prosper. You don't have to, you don't have to seek it. You don't have, to des you don't have to give to get. You just give with a pure heart. And guess what will happen? You'll begin to prosper because God will bless you if you bless others. Amen? If you refresh others, you, will, you yourself will re be refreshed. And you know, it's funny because if you're coming to church, and you're like me, there's seasons in my life where church becomes stagnant, and you don't sense the presence of God as much. And then you begin pointing fingers. Well, it must be this preacher. I don't, you know, his word, you know, he's not preaching good anymore. Or, you know, the worship team, they're just not on par, you know, or, you know, the prayer team's not praying enough. Uh, something's wrong with the church. Well, you know what? I'll tell you something. Start refreshing others, and you yourself will be refreshed. You can go to the deadest church, and you can sit there and be filled with the presence of God. Because as you refresh others, as you pour into others' lives, the presence of God will come back to yours. That's the truth. That's the truth. I'm not preaching now. That's, this is, no, I'm just kidding. This is the truth. Amen? Now, the Bible actually has a lot to say about generosity in the area of finan finances. Now, there's over 500 verses in the Bible pertaining to faith. There's over 500 verses pertaining to prayer. But there's over 2,500 verses that speak about finances. Did you know that? 2,500 verses. So I would say that finances is, is very important to God. Wouldn't you say so? All of these verses, over 30% of Jesus' parables are about money. And so what happens is the church, well, we don't want to talk about money because it's a taboo subject. You know, I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want people to think we're in it for the money, so we don't talk about it, right? And how many know there's two ditches? There's the poverty ditch, and there's a the hyper-prosperity ditch. But how many know there's a center road? And we want to be on that road where God is, amen? And so here's a, a quote by John Bevere. The most important doctrine of Scripture, the devil always wants to pervert it. Always. You, you think about a divine healing, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you know, finances, all the things that are really, really important that can actually transform your life. The enemy wants to come in and twist it. And so what we have to do, especially in the area of generosity, and this is why I'm going to share a lot of scriptures, because you've got to see verse by verse what God says about finances. Okay? Now, there's one thing that fights against the spirit of 
generosity. And I want to know what it is, because if I can find out what's fighting against the spirit of generosity, then I can fight back. And so here it is. There's a, there's a, a book called The Day America Told the Truth by James Patterson and Peter Kim. And they, they interviewed a bunch of people, and these, this is what they came up with. What would you be willing to do for $10 million? This was the question. 25% of people said they would abandon their entire family. 23% said they'd become a prostitute for a week. 16% said they'd give up their citizenship. 16% said, I'll, I'll just leave my spouse. I mean, these, this is terrible, okay? Um, go to the next slide there. Um, what would you be uh, willing to do for, for $10 million? 10% would withhold a testimony to let a murderer go free. 7% would kill a stranger. 3% would put their kids up for adoption. Okay? What does this tell you? <laughs> what does this tell you? This tells you that selfishness is alive and well. Selfishness is alive and well. And selfishness is the enemy of generosity. That's why God is so, he wants us to be extravagant givers. He, because anytime there's selfishness, when you say, you know what, I, don't, I, I know I've got to care for my own needs, but God, here you go. And you, you sow and you give generously. You defeat the spirit of poverty. You defeat the spirit of selfishness that holds you to your stuff. Can I hear an amen? That's the truth. Uh, J.K. Chesterton said this. Among the rich, you will never find a really generous man, even by accident. They may, give your mon they may give their money away, but they will never give themselves away. They are egotistic, secretive, dry as old bones. To be smart enough to get all that money, you must be dull enough to even want it. And we're talking about the ultra-rich, people that just, I just need more money. I just need more money. And they, they pursue money. How many know money will not buy you happiness? Amen? So... So let's look at this verse, Proverbs 11, 24. It says, the world of the generous gets larger and larger. Say larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. And I don't know if you've ever seen this, but people who are generous and they're blessing and they're sowing, it always comes back. It always does. You cannot outgive God. You cannot, because God's nature is that God is a generous God. God is a giver. And so when you walk in the spirit, you, as a Christian, you're going to want to, you're going to want to give, all right? As a Christian, generosity is not optional. It is not optional. Second Corinthians chapter eight, verse seven says, but just as you excel, this is Paul speaking in everything, say everything, everything. all things in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnest and in your love for all of us. See that you also excel in the grace of giving. In other words, you know, we want to grow in our faith. We want our speech to change. Some of you don't use the same words you used to use when you got angry, remember? You, your, your speech is developing. You're maturing. You're maturing in your faith. You're able to believe God even when times are dark. You're able to say, okay, God, I believe. You, you're beginning to develop as a Christian. But how many know that we need to grow in the grace of giving? It's so important because it's part of our maturing process. Prayer, good deeds, volunteering, acts of service and kindness do not take the place of generosity. If God doesn't have your checkbook, he doesn't have your heart. I'll say that again. If God doesn't have your checkbook, he doesn't have your heart. If God is able to talk to you, and I don't know if I've shared this story, but when I was in Bible school, God spoke to me sitting in a meeting where the professor was teaching the Bible. He was, a, he was a prophet. So every time he would give it a lesson, he'd be throwing out prophetic words. And God had spoken to me about giving $50, because I had a $50 bill, to an African foreign exchange student, putting it in a slot, not telling him who did it, because he had a little mail slot at the Bible school. And so I started doing what we all do sometimes, argue with the Lord. You know, this can't be God. It must be the enemy. He's trying to break me, you know, I... I'm in Bible college. I work part-time. I don't have the money. I need this 50 bucks. And you start questioning. And then this, this guy gets up, and he's teaching on a, on a subject that had nothing to do with this, Peter McDonald. And in the middle of his sermon, he goes, you got to learn to obey God. If God tells you to give 50 bucks to somebody, you got to do it. <laughs> and I'm sitting like, okay, Lord, I get the picture. That 50 bucks went in his mail slot, just like that, right? 
God is a generous God. It's not optional. Paul is saying you need to add generosity to your growth in faith. It, generosity is actually the heartbeat of heaven. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave the most precious thing. So God is a God of generosity. Here's another thought. All Christians are generous. All Christians are generous. And, and the reason I say that is to be a Christian means that you're Christ-like. We talk about the fact that we're a church that models Jesus and we share his love. Jesus was generous. Jesus took a little boy's lunch and he fed 5,000 people before his sermon. I mean, he, he was a generous God. Jesus was generous. He laid down his life. And so if we're going to be like Christ, we need to be generous. Why? Because God is generous. Okay? We're created in his image. We have his DNA. And we are designed to be incredible generous. And so we will be generous if we belong to Jesus. Amen? So, moving on. Let's look at the Bible. Let's see what the Bible says, descriptions about the generosity of our God. First verse is Romans 10, verse 12. And it says this, Romans 10, 12. Waiting for my PowerPoint. Is it coming? There we go. We got it. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call upon him. God gives generously. Next verse. You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet he for your sake became poor so that by his poverty you could be made rich. So, you know, what? I'm, gonna, I'm just going to take on the form of, sir, I'm going to become poor. I'm going to become, you know, poor in spirit. I'm going to become poor financially. I'm going to become poor so that those following me can become rich. Like, talk about a generous God. Do you ever stop to think about the generosity of our God? Let's go to the next verse. Titus 3, 6. He generously poured out his spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And just so you know, when you ask God, say, Father, would you give me the Holy Spirit? He doesn't just go, well, here, I'll just give you a little teaspoon of the Holy Spirit. He gives you a bucket full. He gives us all things that pertain to life and godliness have been deposited into us. We just have to figure out how to use the thing. But God has given it to us by his spirit. He's generous. He pours. He's a God that pours abundance on us. That is the heart of God. James chapter 4, 6. And he gives grace, how? Generously. As the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Psalm 100, verse 5. And this is out of the Message Bible because I like the way it says it here. Next verse. It says, for God is sheer beauty, all generous in love, loyal always and forever. Isn't that our God? All generous. That is our God. Psalm 130, verse 7 and 8. O Israel, wait and watch for God. With God's arrival comes love. With God's arrival comes generous redemption. No doubt about it. He will redeem Israel and buy back Israel from captivity to sin. I mean, guys, we, we serve a generous God. And so we need to be a generous people. So what the enemy wants to do in our hearts is he wants us to be stingy and worry about self and our own needs uh, and then and we lose the ability to be generous. Amen? We need to be a generous people. So, Psalm 37, 21 says, The godly are generous givers. Proverbs twenty two twenty six 26 says, Godly love to give. There's verse after verse after verse about generosity. And that's supposed to be our nature. That's supposed to be how we respond when God speaks to our heart. We need to... You know, not give reluctantly, but give with a cheerful heart because we're furthering the kingdom. Everything you have is God's, and only what you give away will have eternal significance in the end. Right? Here's a story that I'm going to read to you here. A story is told that one day a beggar by the roadside asked for alms from Alexander the Great as he passed by. How many know Alexander the Great? So Alexander the Great's walking by. There's a beggar there. And the man was poor and wretched and had no claim upon the ruler, no right to even lift his hand to the ruler, yet the emperor threw him several gold coins. He said, here, he threw gold coins into the beggar's hands, and, a, and the person standing with him was astonished at his generosity and commented, sir, copper coins would adequately meet a beggar's needs. Why give him gold? And Alexander responded in royal fashion, copper coins would suit the beggar's needs, but gold coins suit Alexander's giving. Amen? 
And so we're, he said, I'm not, I'm not going to give of the, I'm going to give of abundance. And that's how God wants us to be as a church. Giving is not so much about the need that you're giving to, it's about the nature of the giver. And that's what God's looking for. What, what is the nature of the giver? Why are you giving? Because I am a spiritual descendant of Christ, I'm a generous giver. Selfishness just doesn't align with our spiritual DNA. Amen? And so what happens when a church becomes stingy and stops giving and stops with generosity, what happens is there's a cap that comes over the house of God. Amen? We read in Malachi, it's talking in this content, in Malachi it's talking about tithing, but it says that if you bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that, that there may be food in my house. And we're talking about spiritual food in the New Testament testament content that people want revelation you want to grow i want to have revival i want to see the things of the spirit but you cap god from moving because you're not giving generously amen and we don't want to do that we want we want the abundance of knowledge and wisdom and food to come into the house of god amen here's another thought blessing is a byproduct of generosity okay and i want to say this notice it's not the goal some teachers when they talk about finances they say that you know, you need to give to get, right? We're not saying that. You're not giving to get. You're giving because you have a, a heart to give. But there's always a blessing that comes with it, okay? And, you know, I was in Bible school, and a, and a, a, a student comes up to me, and he said, I said, I really like your coat. He goes, yeah, yeah, great. It's really nice. And I was just complimenting him on his coat. Well, the next day he comes in, he goes, I want to give you my coat. And he, he gave me this really nice coat. And I thought, I felt really good. And I said to him, I said, why, why'd you do that? You, you can keep it. He goes, no, no, no. I want you to have it. And do you know what? When I asked him that question, I expected to hear, I gave it to you because I wanted to bless you. Or maybe I gave it to you because um, the Lord spoke to me to give it to you. And I, you know, I just feel God wants you to have it. That would have made me feel pretty good. But you know what he said to me? He said, well, I'm looking for a new coat, a more expensive coat, so I figured I need to sew a coat to get a coat. Do you know how that made me feel? It made me feel like dirt. Get it? Dirt? Seed? No. I got to sow a seed in the dirt to, to reap a harvest of a new coat, and I felt like a piece of dirt. I thought, well, that's great. You know, you're using me for your blessing, right? And so you see that see the motive was wrong. Now, the truth is he probably did receive a coat. I mean, who knows? But the, the reality was the motive was wrong. Did you hear what I'm saying? And so we have to give and realize that the byproduct of a heart of generosity is God will bless you. You cannot outgive God. Amen? Let's look at another verse. Proverbs 11, 24, 25. One man gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. And so here's the thing. If you give freely, you'll gain more. Now, how many here believe the Bible? I just want to know, do you believe what the Bible says? I actually believe this. If you will give freely, you'll gain even more. And if I had time, I would give a ton of testimonies how I have given and God has poured back. And I, there's many of you in this place who could do the same thing, right? And in reality here, this whole message is not because I'm preaching to a problem. I'm just bringing the revelation of the truth out, okay? So we, we have a generous church. I'm not saying we don't. We're bringing the truth out, okay? Did you know that it's, imp it's not possible to create an empty hole? Did you know that? Nature will not allow it. If there's nothing there, air will come in and fill it, right? Air will fill it. And when you give, God always comes and fills that void, He's a faithful God. And you know what? It's important to understand that you cannot outgive God. The more, the more you give, the more God gives back. In Psalm 120, uh, 112, verse 9, it says, They share freely and give generously to those in need. Their good deeds will, will be remembered for a few days. Oh, forever. See, when we, when we give freely and generously to those in need, our good deeds are remembered forever we're storing up treasures in heaven remember we got to think from an eternal perspective when you give here towards the kingdom of god you're storing up treasure in heaven forever that's an awesome promise okay and so 
Let's go to the next verse here. Ecclesiastes 11.1. 1. Be generous. Invest in the act of charity. Charity yields high returns. Charity yields high returns. Luke 6, verse 38. Give, and it will be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And so whatever you give, you're going to get that measure back, all right? So if you're a capful Christian, like I talked about before, how many remember that? And you're just going to give a little bit of love or a little bit of support or a little bit of finances to somebody else. Guess what's coming back? A little bit. You can't violate that principle. So it's a win-win situation. If you decide, I'm going to give it extravagantly, I'm going to pour out, then God is able to pour it back. Isn't that good news? When God sees someone overtaken with a spirit of generosity, I believe that uh, he can trust them with the conduit of his blessings. When your heart is not attached to the things of this world and you can give away... You know, I, I heard a story um, about a man, a millionaire, who's a believer, and I think he had, I, I don't know how many hundred millions of dollars in the bank account. And he was, he was he, you know, he's a Christian man, and he's a businessman, he's looking at his accounts, and he, he was kind of excited. He said, you know, it's great, I got, I'm secure. And the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, I want you to give every dime away. So he said, okay, I'll, I'm going to pray on this, make sure it's God. <laughs> So he prayed for a few days and talked to his pastor and then decided, no, this is what I need to do. And so he took it all. He gave it all away. Now, he didn't, he didn't shut down his businesses. He gave it all away. And he said he had zero in his account. His businesses were running. God blessed his businesses. In one year, he had double what he had in the account. That's a generous heart. And you say, well, if I had millions of dollars, I'd do that. Why don't you do what you can with what you have and watch how God will multiply it? You have to start with the right heart, right? That's the key. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 10 and 11. For God is the one who gives seed to the farmer, then bread to eat. In the same way, he will give you many opportunities to do what is good, and he will produce a great harvest of generosity in you. So God is going to create a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched so that you can give even more generously. So, see, this is the reality of the, of the word of God. God says if you will give, it's seed that's been given, you sow it, you'll receive a harvest for the purpose of sowing a bigger harvest, and then you receive a harvest, and you sow again, and the next thing you know, you are, and it's not just money, I mean, it's love, it's time, it's care, it's all kinds of things, but as you give, it'll come back, it'll come back, it'll come back, it'll come back, and you will not have a heart that's tied to this world anymore, because no longer will mammon rule you. You will rule mammon and use it for the kingdom's purposes. Amen? The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. But I'll tell you what. It's the love of money. It's not money that's evil. It's the love of money. The money can actually transform the world for the good. Amen? So I want to say this. Here's one more thought. Selfishness actually stifles happiness. And so if you're, in Proverbs 14, verse 30, 31 says, A heart at peace gives life to the body. But envy rots the bones. He who oppresses the poor shows contempt for the maker, but whoever is kind to the needy honors God. A heart at peace. You know, you're truly at peace when you trust God. And I think that we should be saving, we should be planning for our future and for our retirement and all that stuff. We need to be wise with our finances. When I talk about finances, you know, it's funny. I had a guy who I lived with when I was in Bible school. I, I, I room and boarded at his place. And he got caught up into the hyper-prosperity message. And so he was given to this ministry, and they were saying, you know, you need, you, need to, you, know, you need to give to get, right? You need to sow to get, right? And so he was giving, he was taking his mortgage payment and putting it into some ministry somewhere, or taking his car payment and stuff. And then wondering why he's losing his house. He said, this doesn't work. And I said, no, no, it does work. But the reality is this. The Bible says give your money, not the bank's. <laughs> you're, giving, you're, you're, sowing, you're sowing seed for BMO. Is this your mortgage payment supposed to? You pay your bills. You take care. You be responsible. Pay your bills. And then what you have, then you can give. That's your money to give. Right? You don't borrow money to give. Right? And so you can be foolish with this, too. You've got to be wise 
uh, and you have to budget, you have to work with that, but you have to have a generous heart, okay? Does that make sense? Um, but selfishness is the opposite of who we're called to be. If you're selfish um, in marriage, you're not going to have a happy marriage. It's not true. It's all about your needs and not about your spouse's needs, and you, you're not going to be happy because you both need to be unselfish. You've got to be giving to one another. It's the same way with uh, finances, uh, with talent, you know, um, if, if you're selfish with your heart, you end up lonely because you don't, you're not sharing, you're not connecting with people. And so selfishness is contrary to the nature of God. And the only way and the best way to break that spirit of selfishness is to say, I'm going to be a generous person. And I'm going to give and I'm going to trust God. And if his word says he's going to pour back, I'm going to believe him and I'm just going to obey him. And I'm going to be generous uh, in my giving. I want to tell you a story about a woman named Eunice Pike. And uh, she worked with the uh, Maztec Indians in southwest Mexico. During this time, she discovered many interesting things about these beautiful people. For instance, the people seldom wished someone well. They, they were just, they wouldn't wish people well. Not only that, they are hesitant to teach one another or to share the gospel with one another once they got saved. Interesting. And she asked, who taught you how to bake bread? The village baker answered, uh, I just know how to do it. And then, uh, meaning he had acquired the knowledge without anyone's help. So Eunice says this odd behavior stems from an Indian's concept of limited good. So in other words, they believe there is only so much good, so much knowledge, so much love to go around. To teach another means you might drain yourself of knowledge. To love a second child means you have to love the first child less. To wish someone well, say, hey, have a good day, means you have just given away some of your own happiness which cannot be reacquired, by the way, according to their spiritual beliefs. And so I want to say this. Sadly, many Christians, we live our lives this way, and we you say, well, I, I don't want to give too much, as if, as if there's a cap on generosity. I mean, you, that's, a, that's a, just a false belief, right? Give, and it shall be given unto you. Amen? Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, will men pour back into your bosom. That's a spiritual principle. You know, there's two ways to get enough. One is to accumulate more and more, and the other is to desire less. I rather desire less and focus on the things of the kingdom of God instead of this world that's pa it's passing away. I like to use the money that God gives me to fund the kingdom, to bless others, because the Bible says that we need to store up our treasures. Where? In heaven, where moth and rust cannot decay them, but not on earth. And we're so focused on a dash between two numbers, our life here on earth, without realizing you're storing up treasures in heaven when you're faithful in your giving. Amen? I have a um, couple more scriptures here. 2 Corinthians 9.50. Thank God for his son, a gift too wonderful for words. Too wonderful for words. And the next one is Isaiah 32, verse 8. But the generous people plan to do what is generous, and they stand firm in their generosity. What we're going to do now is I have a video that we're going to play. It's a song. Maybe some of you heard it. Listen to the words, because the, the song is about a man who died, okay? And he's standing at the pearly gates, and he meets St. Peter, and St. Peter is taking him to his mansion. And so we're going to watch that or listen to that song. Go ahead, Brian. We turn the volume up, Doug. Bring the video over, too. It's not there? He said a friend to a friend one day There was a man who passed away St. Peter met him at the gate Pete said, walk with me if you will, I'll take you to the house you build. The man said, I can't wait. They passed a mansion made of stone, but with each new house he's shown, they get smaller by degree. Stop in front of a two-room shack, Pete said, I hope you're happy with that. The man said, how can this be? Pete said, that's all the lumber. That's all the lumber, that's all the lumber you sent. Look 
Looks like a builder, man, he's got your number. That's all the number you sent. Just listen to the words. He's like, he didn't know what to say. The poor guy was blown away and said, You mean this is what I deserve? Pete said, Well, I'm afraid it's so. It's too late, but now you know. You should have done better work. You mean not lying cheap and helping old ladies cross the street? Pete said, Well, that's a start. Remember that man back in that great big house? You found out early what it's all about. Build that place with his heart. As for you, that's all the lumber. That's all the lumber. That's all the lumber you sent. Looks like a builder, man, he's got your number. That's all the lumber you sent. Hey, what if that man was me? And I feel that miserably. You show me things I don't want to see. Send me back to earth again. Is that something you can do? Pete said, It ain't up to me. If it was, I'd like to see how you plan to improve. I'd love God, I'm a fellow man. Take a wife and make a stand. Be the givingest guy I can be. And when I get back to this neighborhood, there'd be a gigantic pile of wood. Not see what's this I see And you tell me that's all the lumber Oh that's your lumber That's all the lumber you sent Looks like the builder man he's got your number That's all the lumber you sent That's all the lumber Oh that's your lumber That's all the lumber you sent like the builder man he's got your number that's all the number you said all right sorry i should have checked and made sure the video was working but you get the point from the song he shows up and he has a little little shack and he's like what is that and peter said you only sent a little bit of lumber so you know the reality is every we store up treasures in heaven when we give of our heart, of our time, of our finances, of our service. Everything you do is storing up treasures for you in heaven. So what I want to do is I want to activate this word. How many would like to do something to kind of activate and, and break a spirit of poverty in this house? Amen? <laughs> if there's anything, we want to break it. So I want to say this. What we're going to do, we're going to do something that is not going to benefit this church. It has nothing to do with this church. But I was praying, and the Lord spoke to me very clearly. Uh, we're going to take up an offering next Sunday over and above our tithes and offerings at the end of the service, not for this church, and we're going to do it again the following week at the end of this series, and we're going to raise enough money to buy a new vehicle for the New Life Girls Home. Let's hear it. Let's give it up. Okay? And because we, you know, we want to bless them. We've got these women that are working. They have, they have a minivan, and they have a, a small car. The car is damaged, so they can't get their girls in and out of town. And I, I just thought, what a shame. So as a church, we are going to bless you guys. Is that all right? Do you mind? Okay. We're going to bless them. So what I want you to do is just this week, just be praying and saying, Lord, what would you have me give? I want to give cheerfully. Some of you, you know, 25 bucks is a stretch. Some of you can give 500, you know, whatever. Camille and I are going to be the first to sow into this. And we're going to say it has nothing to do with our church, but it's going to bless another ministry in our community. Amen. And, I, I, and basically in two weeks, we'll see, you know, how generous we are. We're going to have a used vehicle, which is fine, a used vehicle. Who knows? We might even have a brand new vehicle. Who knows? But we want to bless you guys because you're serving these young girls in, in our community, and we want to bless them. How many, how many want to do that? Amen? Awesome. So next Sunday, we're going to take them an offering. So just be praying and ask the Lord. No... No, no compulsion. Just say, Lord, what would you have me give? And God will stretch you as he stretches us. 
and we're going to bless you guys. Amen? We're going to bless you guys. So two offerings next week and the next week after that. So be in prayer. Don't forget. Please pray about it. The other thing, another way we can be generous is I know I, Pierre was telling me this, this morning that uh, he heard from Pastor Pablo. The church is fine. How many remember the first church that was planted? All right, the church is fine. Some of the homes of the congregant members, they've lost their roofs. and their sh- If you've been to Cuba, they, they have little shacks and stuff in Cuba. And so we can't just send money there because uh, you can't send money into a communist country without a charitable number. Uh, but Jim and Martina have a number, a way to legally give money. They have a Facebook page set up. So if you can even give 40 bucks, 50 bucks, whatever, and sow it through their website, 40, 50 bucks will put a new roof on someone's house in Cuba, right? So it doesn't have to be big money, but pray and ask God, hey, how can I help Cuban families as well? That's another thing. What's the, web, what's the Facebook page? Okay, St. Saint, okay, well, Saint, Saint Louis, uh, Lucia, St. Lucia Relief Fund. Yeah, we'll put it on the website, okay? And the reason why I'm bringing this up, and many of you know, you've been to Cuba, you've, you know some of these families, and their homes are wrecked. So we can help them, you know? Let's do it. Let's just send them a bit of money. We'll send it through another church. I don't care. Send it through Jim's church, because he's got a number, and he can help those families, okay? So those are the two areas I want you to be just praying about this week, asking God. And um, like I said, this we have a generous church, so I didn't preach this message because we're not. But once a year, I want to just remind us let's instill the generous spirit of generosity and uh peter is going to continue this series next week and we're going to have a good time amen awesome so if you guys uh, if anybody wants prayer or anything we're going to open the altars if you need but other than that we're finished for today why don't we stand i'm going to close in prayer amen hallelujah father i thank you god that you are such a generous god father i thank you lord that we have this opportunity we get to give we get to bless another ministry in our community we're so excited about that father and i just ask god that you would speak to our hearts this week concerning what you would have us give lord and we're going to give cheerfully lord and we're going to store up treasures in heaven and we thank you for it in jesus name i pray for every person in this house lord i pray that you will bless the blessings of abraham would come upon even their finances lord they're going to be blessed coming in blessed going out uh, with a heart that's generous In Jesus' mighty name.